thanks to Legatum for inviting me, and thanks to you all for, for coming. I suppose I could say that I'm grateful that I'm giving this talk just after the shock results in the European elections, but that really wouldn't be a very honest way of beginning, because quite frankly, at least for me, they weren't a shock at all. They were fully predicted and predictable. But they do give, I think, a pretty clear indication of just how great the disillusion is across Europe with, well, many things, the EU in particular, but also, I think, our current political class and political institutions in general. And I do actually, myself, attribute uh, some of the blame for that to the EU for making citizens feel more and more isolated and remote from politicians and political decisions. And this is an aspect of the debate which goes way, way, way beyond economics, and we may want to bring it up later. That's to say, um, what sort of citizens and what sort of state do we want to, to live in? And I think that's very much connected with the European issue. Now tonight I'm going to divide my talk into five main sections. First of all, to say something about why the EU came into being. Secondly, has it been a success? Thirdly, what is the trouble with it? Fourthly, what to do to put it right? And lastly, a word or two about the position of the UK if it were to leave the EU. How did it come into being? Now, I know you all know this in some sense, but I think it's worth reflecting on the origins and um, drawing some conclusions from those origins. The EU came into being very much in the shadow of the Second World War. It was after that terrible conflict that well, a good deal of European leaders, but also quite a lot of European popular opinion, decided that, as it were, nothing like this must ever happen again. What we must do is somehow or other subdue the passions and rivalries of nation states and build some common European identity. In 1957, the Treaty of Rome is signed with very much that as a backdrop and in particular in France and Germany, the feeling that those two countries in particular must unite to avoid the, well, the, the, the phenomenon that had happened three times in the last century, which is a Franco-German war. Also, of course, this was the midst of the Cold War. So the shadow, as I say in the book, of a terrible war just finished, and in the foreshadow of a yet more terrible war, which may be yet to begin. The world was characterized by the rivalry between these great power blocs, the United <coughs> States and the Soviet Union, not just, as it were, on their own, because they had their own acolytes as well. It was, uh, these were the champions, if you like, of their respective blocs, but you had a huge number of countries behind, clustering behind the United States on one hand, and others clustering behind the Soviet Union on the other. This was a meeting of two giants, and it seemed very much to a number of people that the European countries, the old, formerly powerful countries of Europe, were like um, minnows, if you like, pygmies, caught between these two giants. Um, and if they didn't do something, this was going to be a most uncomfortable result, politically, culturally, and economically, because it was quite easy to conclude, I'm not saying this is right, but it was quite easy to conclude that in economics at least size matters. If you weren't one of these great blocks, then you risked being in a very weakened position economically. And of course, after the war, Europe was uh, massive war destruction, um, as st still not uh, free trade between European countries. But if you really wanted to progress, it was easy to believe you had to be part of a large block. And after all, both Britain and France had been part of a large, large block before, namely their own empires, which they were beginning to shed. It was already becoming inevitable that that was, that was going to happen. Uh, I say, in this respect, size matters, but it may seem a bit strange because we're all used to the idea, of course, that Russia is a basket case, which indeed it is, um, and the Soviet Union proved to be a disaster, uh, which it was, uh, and maybe even indeed it uh, is going to serve as a pretty good warning of what may happen to the EU, because in my view there are some similarities, also some big differences between the two. But you mustn't forget that for much of the later Cold War period, not the very end, but the sort of middle bit anyway, it seemed to many observers as if the Soviet Union was succeeding economically. The CIA was petrified, I won't quite say paranoid, but petrified that before long the Soviet Union was going to overtake the United States in economic prowess. And after all, they had, as it were, effectively won the Second World War. You had all these, you know, later on Sputniks going up and five-year plans being fulfilled and over-fulfilled and all the rest of it. Now we know, of course, that the 
reality was a bit different. But at the time, it seemed the Soviet Union was massively successful economically. So very successful United States, very successful Soviet Union. In the middle, these flibbly gibbet European countries trying to escape from their past. What on earth should they do? Well, the answer was, of course, to band together. And in banding together, they would enjoy the benefits of scale, size of home market that the United States and the Soviet <coughs> Union had. They'd also acquired political and diplomatic clout and therefore be able to throw their weight about on the world stage, which would have both political and economic benefits. Now, of course, this period when people thought these things, just to state the obvious, is remind ourselves of what <coughs> it was like in other respects. Technologically, no internet, well, apart from a few huge mainframes, uh, hangovers from the Second World War, no computers, uh, no globalization. Of course, there'd been globalization in the 19th century, but it collapsed in the beginning of the 20th century. This is before the rise of the emerging markets. The term wasn't even heard of. India and China, nowhere to be seen. China about as significant economically as the Isle of Wight. <laughs> now, this is the world in which these great men, the European fathers, had their vision and constructed what we now call the EU. Of course, it wasn't called that first of all. But that's the world in which this institution was forged, and essentially we're still living in the same dream world, you might say nightmare world, that they envisaged as a solution for Europe. Uh, has it been a success? Well, in this sense, I'm going to come as a complete disappointment to the raving Eurosceptics, you know, the ones who tend to wear stripy blazers and have mad staring eyes, <laughs> because in some respects, I think the answer is yes. In some respects, it has been a success. First of all, uh, there has, of course, been no European war. Now, as I say in the book, did we tell them the title, by the way, and that's available downstairs for a knockdown Thank price of £15, uh, <laughs> signed copies. Uh, in the book, I say... I give due obeisance to the counter-argument that isn't really awful lot to do with the EU. It was really to do with the fear of nuclear bomb, NATO, the presence of the Americans in Europe, all that stuff. That's what really kept the peace, and I think there's a lot to that argument. But I wouldn't want to swallow it wholesale, frankly. Um, given the historical record of war between France and Germany, and given the state of post-war Europe, I think it takes a bit of well, historical courage, I might say foolhardiness, to conclude that the EU didn't play any role in keeping the peace in Europe. It's reading history backwards, I think, to argue that. After all, um, it looked as though the communists could take over in France and Italy, and there were fascist dictatorships in power in Spain and Portugal, and before very long, of course, the colonels took over in Greece, and indeed there'd been a civil war in Greece just after the Second World War very strong Communist Party. Uh, who knows how the European um, stage would have been occupied without the EU. I, for one, am not willing to say the EU played no role in it. So I'm going to give a sort of a half tick to the EU on that. I give higher marks to a second factor. That's to say the EU acted as what I call a receiving house for the refugee countries uh, from communism the countries in Eastern Europe, the former members of the Soviet bloc, who left that system, I mean, effectively without the EU, I think wouldn't have known quite where to go. Now, I give the EU very high marks for this in the sense that uh, this is what I would say has been the EU's historical destiny and its great contribution to mankind. So if someone asked me the question, would the world have been a better place if the EU had not existed, <coughs> my answer to it is no, it would not. I think it would have been a worse place, partly because of this point about war, and secondly, because of the point I'm making now about uh, the former Eastern Europe, because what happened is that with the EU there as a, uh, a draw, an incentive, governments in the former Soviet bloc were able to use the idea of EU membership as an incentive and a, uh, a brickbat as well, actually, forcing their electorates to accept the f reforms that you might say they should have accepted <coughs> anyway in their own interest, but they wouldn't have done. But the incentive of becoming a member of the EU enabled these countries to get through all sorts of reforms, not just economic but political, and essentially brought these countries back into the fold of, I was going to say Western Europe, but that's the whole point. Mm -hmm. There hadn't been a Western and Eastern Europe before, 
brought them back into the fold of Europe. Um, and after the event, being a member of the EU kept them largely, although there were one or two instances of backsliding, pretty much kept them on the straight and narrow ever since. I give the EU very high marks for this. Interesting, though, that it wasn't an objective that was there in the Treaty of Rome, and to the best of my knowledge, none of the early supporters of the EU envisaged that this is what it would do. So it were, as it were, it's an achievement by accident, although it's a great achievement in my view, and it's largely over. Then there's economic growth, which was part of what the EU was about, and I say it was largely political from the start, but clearly it had a strong economic element as well. It wasn't the case, you know, at the start of the EU of um, leaders saying, look, we've got this great political project, which is going to cost you, the citizens of Europe, a massive amount of money. Uh, no, it wasn't that. It was largely a political project, but they also said, it would bring you prosperity for the reasons that I've given a moment ago. And by the way, the same was true of the euro. You hear all sorts of people saying now, well, this is a political thing. You know, I mean, we've got this great vision of Europe to hold together. And uh, we always said it was a political thing and it would be costly. Balderdash. They said nothing of the kind. What they said was, OK, the euro is a political project and we want it to cement Europe together, but it's going to bring prosperity. None other than that great expert, Chris Hume, argued <laughs> repeatedly. <laughs> Um, I don't know whether he's been believed or not, but he re argued repeatedly that through all sorts of things like, you know, not having to have, to have a calculator to compare prices in one currency versus another, massive gains would be unleashed across the European continent by price harmonisation. That's what they argued, these people. The euro would bring great benefit. Well, similarly with the EU. The fathers of the EU did not argue that it was going to be very costly. They argued it would bring economic success. Well, did it? Well, in the early years, there was quite a lot of evidence to the effect that it did. And this is extremely important. The early years, economic growth on the continent after the EU's formation, very high. No higher, by the way, in most cases than in the years before the EU's formation, but they were very high. So if you look at the years from 1958 to 73, 73 being the year that Britain joined, the average growth rate, economic growth rate, in real terms, per annum, in the countries that were then members of the EU, that's to say the original six, the average growth rate was just shy of 5%, which is pretty remarkable. Now, over the same period, the average growth rate for the UK was 2.8%. This proved to be an extremely important difference. Now, 2.8, as it so happened, was about the fastest rate of growth Britain had ever sustained for a long period <laughs> and the whole of its industrial history, or in fact, ever. But um, nevertheless, the idea was this marked Britain's failure and people got jumped up and down and got extremely worried about it. Uh, and of course, it meant if this disparity continued that Britain would progressively lose out to continental Europe, uh, our relative GDP would fall and everything that hangs on that would fall as well, including power and influence and prestige and so on and so forth. And lots of people concluded that um, if we stayed out, then this is exactly what would happen. And so a movement began to join on the basis that this was the key to economic success. Now, um, the British establishment never ceases to amaze me. Um, the efforts that it puts into all sorts of mundane things, you know, who touched whose knee 35 years ago, you know, all sorts of stuff, massive, you know, royal commissions, reports on this, that and the other. But when it comes to, to the really, really big decisions, really, really big decisions, it's a nod and a wink down the clock. The establishment just sort of assumes that something is true. And so it was with this particular issue. It was generally assumed, not proved, that... Um, Britain's economic growth was very low relative to the continent because, of course, we weren't members of the EU. In fact, this was complete and utter nonsense because if you looked <coughs> at countries apart from the EU and Britain, you saw that most of them were growing extremely well as well. Um, Australia, Canada, the United States, they were all growing extremely well. Switzerland, there was no real evidence that the EU was doing spectacularly well or that Britain was doing badly because it wasn't in the EU. What subsequent um, studies, and indeed, many people at the time thought was true, um, what these studies showed 
was that Britain's growth rate was low, primarily for British-specific factors, which the British establishment didn't want to face, not least the fact that they were useless. That they'd failed to confront the nation's problems for goodness knows how many years. Very poor management, poor industrial structure, overweening trade unions, masses of industry owned by the state and incredibly inefficient, ludicrous levels of taxation, <coughs> government interference left, right and centre. These were the problems of Britain, nothing whatever to do with not being in the EU. And of course, once Britain tackled these things, her relative economic performance shot up. So actually, if you look at the performance of Britain versus other members of the EU over the last 20 or 30 years, you see that well, we've done extremely well, actually. By GDP, certainly, if you look at other measures like consumption, spectacularly well compared to countries like Germany, which tend to export a lot and invest a lot more than we do. If you look at recent measures of EU economic performance, they're extremely bad, very bad, not just measured against the growth stars of Asia and the emerging markets. There, of course, it's a different ball game. But when measured against the United States, against Britain, against Canada, against Switzerland and Norway, uh, against just about anybody, actually, their poor performance, poor rates of economic growth. And, of course, recently accompanied by horrendous levels of unemployment. Now, why should the economic numbers and performance have been bad? Well, there are a number of reasons, but um, I don't think this is just accidental. I think it's systematic. The key thing is this. The way the EU is structured leads to bad decisions. It's as simple as that. Governance really matters. Why does a swamp island off the coast of Malaysia, not much bigger than the Isle of Wight, the Isle of Wight's done very well tonight, I've got two mentions already, uh, not much bigger than the Isle of Wight, why does that become a major world trading power. The climate, perhaps? Have you been there? <laughs> what is it? I'll tell you what it is, quite simply. It's good governance. It happens to be governed extremely well. Good governance leads to prosperity. Bad governance leads to the lack of it. The EU has been structured in such a way as to produce bad decisions. And there's a whole string of them. Um, the... CAP is a pretty good example. I mean, why on earth do we have a policy, a common agricultural policy, which is wasting goodness knows how many billions of euros, while at the same time, by the way, doing no favours at all to producers in the third world? Why do we have it? Well, it's quite simple, isn't it? It's the politics, the dysfunctional politics of France. The um, pressure on the French government to protect French farmers and the dysfunctional politics of the EU because Germany couldn't afford to... Uh, to uh, offend France, and so France got its way on this ludicrous policy, ludicrous policy, which has cost goodness knows how much. There are a whole series of these issues where the EU <laughs> makes bad decisions, and it makes bad decisions because it's got bad institutions and bad processes and inadequate politicians, many of them corrupt. That's why you get this string of economically disastrous decisions. It's not accidental. It's quite systematic deriving right from the very nature of the institution. Now, the worst of these decisions, pretty bad ones, the worst of these decisions is the formation of the euro. Now, it's tempting to blame all of Europe's recently bad performance on the euro. I've got some sympathy for that, but actually the relatively poor performance of the EU predates the euro. If you look at the figures up to the formation of the euro, the EU was doing bad for quite a time, actually. Since the euro... It's done a lot worse. The euro has been a catastrophe. But why have we got this catastrophe? Now, some people will say, well, it's all been, you know, it's all been a bad accident. If only someone had told us, we'd have done things differently. <laughs> don't give me that one, please. Just don't give me that one. They were told over and over and over again, not least by Eurosceptic economists uh, brought up in these islands, but not exclusively from here, they were told over and over again that this would be a disaster. You couldn't shoehorn all these different economies and cultures <coughs> into a one-size-fits-all monetary policy, still less a one-size-fits-all economy and political entity. It just won't work. It'll end up a disaster. Some people say, oh, yes, but, you know, um, it wasn't it was not really fair because it was going all right at the beginning, you know. It was only when we got the financial crash that problems really started. Well, I mean, you know, 
any old currency union, anything, monopoly, money, the ruble, anything will be fine. It's the same thing, actually. Um, <laughs> will be fine. <laughs> will be fine, you know, if conditions were all calm. That's not the point. You've got to have arrangements that are going to withstand the test, the tests that come when conditions aren't fine and calm. And you have to assume that's going to happen at some point or other. And it was obvious at some stage it was going to occur. The fact things went fine at the beginning is no proof whatsoever. Uh, also, the whole business about disparities, these things show cumulatively. The case of the skeptics was, look, these countries are very different in their inclinations to inflate. You've got some countries that historically have been very bad at controlling inflation. Other countries led by Germany have been extremely good at doing it. Put these two together in a common monetary union, and what you will find over time is the build-up of discrepancies between these two, leading to massive imbalances. That's what they said. That's what's happened. Why did we get the euro? We got the euro because the people running Europe don't understand economics, don't even much care about it. They're obsessed by an outdated political vision deriving from the end of the Second World War and the Cold War, dominated by the idea of France and Germany being bound together with some looser idea of the nature of Europe as a whole, which I'll come to in a moment. So bad, gov bad governance, absolutely fundamental to uh, uh, this business. Now, um, I've already touched on this notion of how did we get here, and I've given you some ideas of what the things are that are wrong with, um, wrong with the <coughs> EU, which would need to be put right. But let me now nail that more precisely. Where does the trouble begin? I've got a clear answer to that. At the beginning, with the Treaty of Rome. The trouble is with the objective of ever closer union. That's what's written into the Treaty of Rome. And that's what's largely speaking been pursued. Now, there are two problems with this as a central objective. The first is, if you start with a group of countries with very different inclinations, structures, institutions, histories, all that sort of stuff, and you want them to be become ever closer, what does, that, what does that imply? There they are, spread all over the place, and you want to shove them all together. Well, it means, of course, regulation and harmonization. That's where it comes from. The excessive burden of regulation and harmonization, again, this is, not a, this is not an accident. It's tempting. Some people say, you know, oh, if only we could have the EU, uh, just as it is, but we'll cut down on all this regulation and harmonization and everything will be fine. Well, how can you do it if you're pursuing ever closer union? That's what's there in the central objective of the wretched thing. That's what people are trying to do, create something similar from bits <coughs> that are very dissimilar. So that thing, right at the very beginning, is, in my view, a problem. The second sense in which it's a problem is that it means that actually you never know quite what you're joining up to. Um, it's tempting to think that when you sign some sort of EU agreement, you're accepting a set of conditions that appear in that particular treaty. But you're not. What you're doing, actually, is you're signing <coughs> up to a process the end of which is unclear. It's always leading on to something else. Um, I don't know who it was in the whole European debate said that um, being in the EU is rather like riding a bicycle. You've got to keep pedaling or you fall off. I've never understood this myself. I mean, why can't you get off the damn thing leaving it against the fence? You know, turn around and have a look or even pedal back the other way or just, you know, just <laughs> get off and leave it. I don't know. But anyway, so... Uh, this thing right at the very beginning, ever closer union. I, I think the vision, you see, is fundamentally wrong. It's all about the size bringing <coughs> benefits, size and integration and harmonization. Very much sort of reminiscent, I think, of the sort of national champion idea in industrial structures. Historically, uh, Europe has done best, actually, but it wasn't like that at all. So Europe's golden age mm -hmm. came when it was a set of competing nation states, and at one point, city-states. Not even Italy was united. The great contribution of Italy to exploration and development came as Venice and Florence and Milan and Pisa and heaven knows where else were rivals. Um, and similarly, the rivalry between Spain and Portugal, Holland, France and Britain. There's a reason for this, I think. Um, this actually prevents, or it doesn't quite prevent, but it's 
against really bad government. Competition is good for government. We're used to the idea that competition is good for companies and it would be daft in most industries to allow a monopoly. But actually this is also true in government. You allow a monopoly government and you get the worst practices imaginable, in particular excessive government spending, because the consequences aren't laid bare. Uh, and that's what the EU is all about, really. It's about spreading monopoly government over the territories of the EU. And you get the same results uh, for politics and political decision-making that you get in industrial structure. On the whole, monopoly ain't a good thing. Competition is. We need governments in one part of Europe doing one lot of things, governments in another part of Europe doing another lot of things. And rather than being forced to do the same thing, let's see the consequences. And in seeing the consequences, that will then spread best practice. Now, I have to say, there's an awful lot that's wrong with Europe, which is not down to the EU. Again, I'm offending my Eurosceptic critics or colleagues or whatever, who will say, goodness me, he's not a real Eurosceptic. I get that, by the way. When I write my columns in the Tory graph some days, I write something about this, and I get disgusted from Tunbridge Wells writing, and you're not a real, call yourself a Eurosceptic, you're not a real Eurosceptic. Um, if I say that not everything in Europe is down to the EU, they think, oh, he doesn't really know anything about the EU. You know, of course it's all down to the EU. Well, it's not all down to the EU. Lots of things that are bad in Europe and dysfunctional in Europe aren't due to the EU. And yet I wrote um, this in one of my Tory Graph columns a few weeks ago. Uh, I reflected on what it is that produces this really very bad relative economic performance in Europe. Some of it's down to the EU. I've given an indication of those things. But a lot of it isn't. But given that the relative poor performance is pretty much Europe-wide, I think you ought to look for a common European explanation rather than a series of different national ones. There's something wrong, as it were, in the state of Europe. And if it isn't all the EU, what is it? Well, I think it's largely a state of mind which is connected with the EU, but it's not entirely explained by the EU. It's to do with the excessive welfare state in Europe, the cradle-to-grave model, which is essentially European. You certainly don't get it in the United States. You don't get it in China or most of East Asia, by the way. Um, and partly associated with that, it's a sort of disdain for success competition business, uh, a dislike of those aspects of society, which, again, you don't get in the United States. And interestingly, you don't get in most of Asia I either. I say it's not entirely due to the EU, but the EU is connected with it because that's exactly what is there in the essence of the EU. It connected, I think, partly with the fact that the EU has been driven largely by lawyers. Apologies for any lawyers here. You're a splendid bunch of people, but I don't think you're very good, I have to say, for running an economy or for setting out the broad vision of how a society should be. My view, it should be run by economists. Um, <laughs> And what I think the EU's contribution to all this was, was that it were to set the direction of travel. So people, countries in Europe and people in Europe, even though what they were doing or not doing might not have been, as it were, precisely down to whatever the EU said or had ruled, I think the EU has sort of created an atmosphere, a direction of travel, in which people and institutions um, feel that they are being restricted. I'll give you one example, which was the Northern Rock crisis here in the UK. I remember Governor King, as he was then, came under quite a lot of criticism for not putting together a behind the doors, closed doors deal of the sort that doubtless Eddie George's predecessor would have done. So he gets the Northern Rock people in, you know, knocks the heads together of various banks in the city, puts them in a room, sort of, you know, pours in beer and sandwiches all night, and they can't come out until they've sorted it all out, and nothing's out in the open. He was asked why he didn't do this. And he said, well, I couldn't have done because it would have been against EU regulations. Now, I'm quite sure that wouldn't have stopped the Banque de France, I have to say. <laughs> They'd have thought about that after the event and redefined quite what the regulations were. And various people have said, actually, that it wouldn't have been against the regulations. But the interesting thing is that Mervyn King thought it was. That's what I mean by this state of mind, which will have to be broken. The last major thing that I think is wrong with the um, EU is that it doesn't know what it is what it's there for, what its limits are. Um, and again, this goes very much, I think, back to the history. If you think that when it was <coughs> formed, or say, stuck between these blocks, large number of companies, countries couldn't join it. Of course, Spain, 
and Portugal dictatorships. Britain, we know, is different. Scandinavia is different. Got the original six making a sort of passable attempt at looking like a recreation of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and then you get the breakdown of communism and the fall of the Berlin Wall, and suddenly the horizons open. And the question is, what, what is Europe? What's it about? Is the aim just to be bigger and bigger and bigger? Is it to unite all of Europe? Which is, well, quite, what is your concept of Europe? Because the Romans had a very different concept. I've got in my book a nice little map of the Roman Empire. Quite interesting, really, because you know, essentially this was uh, a concept of the Mediterranean. The Roman Empire was really just the country spread around the Mediterranean. So that concept of a common culture, a common Greco-Roman culture, was a Mediterranean culture. The Middle East was in, Turkey was in, of course, Egypt was in, North Africa was in, Scandinavia was out, most of Germany was out, the whole of Eastern Europe was out. That's what it was. Is that the sort of thing you're aiming at? Um, do you think that all of Eastern Europe can be in? Ukraine, should that be in? And evidently, some of um, our uh, leaders and betters in <coughs> Brussels and Frankfurt thought that Ukraine should be in, which is one of the reasons why that country is in the position that it's in today. Should Russia be in? If not, why not? And the key test of all is should Turkey be in? Now, I think that people in the EU get the Turkish question completely the wrong way around. There's no doubt to me that uh, if Europe is conceived as it currently is conceived, with free movement of capital and everything, more particularly labour, within the EU, then Turkey cannot be a member. It cannot be a member. And it can't be a member because of the gap in institutions and political culture between Turkey and the rest of Europe. It's going to be a huge country very soon. Before very long, it's going to have a population of about 90 million. It is, of course, predominantly a Muslim country, and uh, nothing wrong with that, but I don't think it's going to gel with the electorates of Western Europe, having this country essentially infiltrating the culture and the customs and the institutions of what they still regard as predominantly Western <coughs> Europe and with free movement of labour. It's simply not on. So you get this, I think, really very unfair to Turkey, system in which it's told it's a candidate member, the EU dangles this every so often, doesn't mean anything by it, it's perfectly obvious politically that Turkey can't join, and so the result is that Turkey is being driven to the east with what I think are dangerous political uh, consequences, strategic consequences. So I would turn this on its head. I think Turkey is such an important country that um, we should say, what is the type of European Union that would allow us comfortably to have Turkey as a member. That's the European Union I would want. And such a European Union could not have the free movement of labour. It couldn't have the objective of ever closer union. It couldn't have full political or fiscal union. It would, in fact, be an association of trade and friendship and cooperation across a range of issues, including military issues. Don't forget Turkey is a member of NATO. So I would want Turkey in. But that tells you that it can't be this sort of European <coughs> Union, a radically different sort of institution. Now, let me turn to my last, last subject, the UK. Um, what would happen if there were a Brexit? I've missed out, actually, what needs to be done to reform it, but perhaps that will come out in conversation. I've been banging on too long already. Um, how would the UK be if it were um, outside the EU? Well, various people say things like... Um, oh, it would be terrible if we left Europe. And I get very uppity at this. And I say, left Europe? What are you talking about, leaving Europe? It's a geographical impossibility. Hasn't happened since, as it were, several ice ages ago. And they say, well, OK, 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 but you know, we'd be turning our backs on our largest market. To which the reply is, we wouldn't be turning our backs on the market at all after a Brexit, we would continue to trade on a massive scale <coughs> with what we now call the EU, and most of our trade would continue. The real, what they think is the real coup de grace, the other side, is the single market. All sorts of people, from Kenneth Clark downwards, who not only have not read the Treaty of Rome, the Treaty of Maastricht, or any other treaty, uh, opine to the effect that everything depends upon the single market. All important to be in the single market. Must be in the single market. Well, what is the single market? Well, it's a combination of free trade within the market, 
adherence to the common external tariff facing exports from outside the single market, and most particularly, the adherence to a common set of regulations. The single market is not a free trade area, it's a common regulatory area. It's from membership of the single market that stems this great tide of regulation that we want to get out of. Actually, my stance is I want to be out of the single market. So when the likes of Kenneth Clark say, oh, you lose access to the single market, I say, thank you very much. That's exactly what I want, to be outside the single market. Then they say, uh, well, you do know, don't you, that um, Norway, um, although it's outside the EU, is still inside the single market because it's negotiated this thing called the European Economic Area. And as such, it has to swallow quite a lot of EU legislation. Um, I wouldn't like the Norwegian solution. It seems to me not to be a viable option for the UK at all. The Swiss position, where they're not in the European Economic Area, in fact, they're not in anything formally, um, but they negotiate a whole series of bilateral agreements with the EU, is more appealing, but I wouldn't even buy that either. And in any case, it's not going to be on offer because the EU is very frustrated by the Swiss arrangements. Um, it's not going to be on offer to us. The arrangement I would like is to have a free trade agreement with the EU. Um, now, people say, well, you know, would that put us at a massive disadvantage? I'll go a stage further than that <coughs> and go back one, down one, and say, well, what do you think the position is at the moment of China, India, the United States, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, you name it? What is their relationship with the EU? Well, I'll tell you, they haven't got one. They haven't even got a free trade relationship. They just sell into the EU. No seats on the commission, not a single MEP. Don't seem to worry about you know, having legislation framed without their influence. Um, they seem to manage to trade all right. Now, what they're all trying to do is to negotiate closer relations with the EU. And before very long, there's going to be an EU-US free trade, free trade arrangement between the EU and the United States. Not at the moment. There's no agreement. But when it comes, it'll be free trade. Are any of them trying to join the single market? You must be joking. Can you imagine in the United States how this would play? You know, in order to have access to the single market on the same basis as the Belgians and the French and the Italians and all the rest of it, we're going to have our regulations over the whole of our economy set in Brussels. How about that? How do you think that would go down in Peoria, Illinois? <laughs> and funny enough, India and China, they're in the same position. So why can't Britain be in that situation? Then people say, oh, well, you know, they're all big countries, you know. I mean, uh, we're just a tiddler, you know. We can't do what the India and China and the United States do. Then I say, Singapore. It's a small country. <laughs> it's sort of an inverse Goldilocks scenario that somehow you've got to have your size, precisely the bit that the Guardian defines as being sensible in order to have a prosperous future outside. This is all nonsense, complete and utter nonsense. The truth of the matter is that Britain, as the sixth largest economy in the world, and believe it or not, still the sixth largest manufacturer in the world, would be in a very strong position indeed to negotiate a free trade agreement with the EU. And if it didn't succeed because of their bloody-mindedness, it would be in the same position relative to trade with the EU that the United States, India, China, Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea are now. Uh, without the regulations, without the payments to the budget, without the CAP. So I think somehow or other it might be able to manage. Now, a lot of people um, think this is all very well, but it would leave us being terribly lonely and isolated, and this is a big problem. It doesn't bother me. I quite like being lonely and isolated, actually. But um, uh, lo it bothers lots of people, particularly that sort of Englishman, sort of Englishman who thinks that the solution to any problem is to join a club. That's been quite a prevalent um, sort of economic thinking in the British establishment over the post-war period <laughs> with dire consequences. So I say I don't think it is the, the answer to all um, problems. However, if that is what your state of mind is, uh, let me just tell you the clubs that would be available. For a start, if we had this free trade agreement with the EU, I think what we ought to set about really is reconstructing EFTA, the European Free Trade Association. This was a monumental error of the British establishment leaving EFTA to join what's become the EU. I understand why they did it. It was a monumental error. We ought to have that as a club. Then there's NAFTA. If we're outside the EU, no reason why we can't join NAFTA. 
That's the North American Free Trade Association. We have a free trade membership of that free trade association. We can have a free trade agreement with the EU. We have free trade agreements with whoever knows who around the world. And of course, there's the Commonwealth. And now I don't think this is by any manner or means some magic bullet. It's not a customs union. Uh, it's not an alternative to the EU. But I think there are strong links there, strong similarities between countries, cultural similarities which um, should enable us to expand our trade and other associations. Um, at a broader level, a sort of 40 or 50,000 feet level, there's something I've felt for a long time that's really very odd about the EU and very odd about the notion that Britain should join it, particularly as it's moving towards, well, join it first of all and subsequently stay in it, as it's moving towards full political union. It seems to me to be completely against the thrust of history and in particular, this country's history. There we are, a few hundred years ago, before the internet, before telegraph, telephone, and all the rest of it, seeing our destiny as all around the world and running an empire bigger than any that the world has ever seen. And by the way, France wasn't far behind. There we were with these seaborne associations all around the world, which led to associations of politics, history, language, law, state of mind, philosophy, with all these people in different parts around the world. Then along comes the internet, globalization, emails, Skype, everything else. So the world is more connected than ever before. And what do we think we should do? What's the idea? Well, the idea is somehow proximity has become extremely important. I don't understand this. If ever there's a time that proximity should be less important, it's now. And for this country to think proximity is important, given our history, it's bonkers. Britain's whole history has been global, and its future should be global. In other words, the idea of plunging your identity in the EU, I say in the book, I think it's the political and economic equivalent of marrying your next-door neighbour. In short, I think the EU is based on an idea whose time has passed. And quite simply, we should reform it very radically, or we should get out. Thank you.